everybody again. This is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. We're getting closer to the end of our brain discussion. So just a, a couple more videos. So in this video H, we're going to focus on the cerebellum. The word cerebellum literally means little cerebrum. And when we look at its major subparts, of which there are three again, you'll see that they are very similar to what we see in the cerebrum. So the three subparts are the cerebellar cortex, so an outer layer of gray matter, as we saw in the cerebrum, a bunch of white matter, but it's in the shape of a tree. And so in Latin, we call it the tree arbor of life, vitae, the tree of life. Now, not shown on this image here, deep within this um, white matter, you can assume that there are nuclei, and we'll just call them cerebellar nuclei. Don't forget that the cerebellum nicely connects with all three subparts of the brain stem. So we have our superior peduncles here, superior cere cerebellar peduncles that connect the cerebellum with the midbrain. We have our middle ones that connect the cerebellum with the pons and the inferior ones connect to the medulla oblongata. And here again, you see the external layer, or I should say the most superficial layer called the cerebellar cortex and then the white matter in the shape of a tree. So it's called the arbor vitae. Most fibers that arise from the cerebellum are going to be ipsilateral. Now, this I'm not saying all of them, but many of them are, and, and they can be ipsilateral because they do not cross over at all. So they start in the left hemisphere of the cerebellum because, again, it's going to have two hemispheres. It's bilaterally symmetrical. So if, let's say... A pathway starts in the left hemisphere of the cerebellum. It tends to stay on the left side of the body. Now, this can be due to the fact that there's no crossing over, or it could be due that there is crossing over twice occurring. The cerebellum is the second biggest part of the brain. Of course, the cerebrum is the biggest. It makes up about 10% of the brain mass. But take a look. It makes up or it, make, it, it contains almost half of the neurons in the whole brain. So there's a reason for why we call it the cerebellum. It really is a mini cerebrum. Now those two hemispheres are interconnected by a little structure that's kind of worm-like, and so we call it the vermis. Vermis literally means worm-like. The cerebellum has some really important functions and even researchers today continue to discover more and more functions of the cerebellum. It's really a structure of our brain that we don't quite understand totally yet, along with the cerebral basal nuclei. And there's a lot of similarity in the functions between the cerebral basal nuclei and the cerebellum, particularly when it comes to the maintaining of muscle tone and therefore balance and posture, okay? They play, the cerebellum is also important in motor learning. In other words, getting better and better at um, using our skeletal muscles to create a, a very effective contraction that allows us to carry out a movement that makes sense. And so it does that by very carefully and constantly tasting, tapping into the motor output that's leaving your primary motor cortex. And it can make adjustments to that motor output based on sensory information. You know, when we when we use our skeletal muscles, whether it's to walk or to pick up something or to turn our head, we most of the time do not just 
start contracting our muscles. We are using our eyes. We might be using our ears. We might be depending on our equilibrium. We might even be depending on smell. We might be feeling things, things that are touching us. Maybe we feel that we're really close to a desk. Things like that. All of these um, pieces of sensory information that enter the brain, our cerebellum can use a lot of that information to then make adjustments in the motor output that arises from the primary motor cortex. You know, let's say you had to pick a pencil off the floor. Just think of how many muscles and how much of the rest of your body, such as your eyes, for instance, such as the feeling, therefore the sensory receptors in your fingers are involved in exec executing that particular movement of picking up that pencil off the floor. If you have damage to the cerebellum, you might be able to bend over, but you might tip over very easily because you don't have good balance anymore. There's not good coordination of all of your muscles because your cerebellum is not communicating properly anymore with the cerebrum. Or you might be able to maintain your balance, but you continually keep grabbing next to the object or pencil. You just don't, or you can, you can reach it, but you cannot really grab it very well uh, with your, you know, fine muscles in your fingers. So as it says here, your cerebellum can send out corrective commands in order to carry out a skeletal muscle movement effectively and efficiently. And it does that also with the help of sensory information. So another thing to point out here, I'm hoping that you understand what I just tried to explain. Notice that I did not ever say that the cerebellum initiates movements. It can't do that. For that, we need that primary motor cortex but it can make our movements much more precise um, compared to what originally leaves that primary motor cortex. Now, more and more research is beginning to show that our cerebellum actually plays a role in language in, and other cognitive functions. Um, and when you're taking your exam, and I'm asking you questions about the functions of the cerebellum. Always try to visualize a person who is very, very drunk. Not to the point that they're fast asleep. But, you know, you've seen plenty of videos of people being pulled over by the police. And they have to walk a straight line. And they have to answer questions. And just think of what you observe there they cannot walk a straight line. So their balance is off. Their eyes are all over the place. Their speech is very slurry. Um, and they can't really um, keep their... They cannot control their skeletal muscles well enough anymore, whether it's talking or walking or just lifting up an arm without um, them looking quite silly. They're just not very coordinated anymore. And so this, of course, tells you that alcohol impairs the functioning of our cerebellum. Okay, so we're finally done discussing all parts of the brain. That is the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. Next, we're going to take a quick look at the two functional brain systems. That is that limbic system, which we've been referring to as the emotional brain, and a few words about the functional uh, brain system called the reticular formation system, which we see located in the brain stem. After that, we'll wrap up the whole brain topic by learning about the various ways that our brain is protected.